and gentlemen, we're now ready for our next speaker, all the way from the United Kingdom. Um, please help me welcome Dr. Akanimo Oden. So I feel very hurt. Are you wondering why? I sat down there and everybody, every speaker who came to the stage was helped at the staircase. Some gender bias, I think. Fantastic. It's really good to be here, I have to say. And I look across the room and I see uh, faces I know and some faces I don't know, but we will know. And, um, I want to thank Bishop Kangwa and his lovely wife, Dr. Nelly Kangwa, our host, for an opportunity to, it's not very often you find people who just decide that they celebrate their birthday just impacting people's lives. That's, that's not normal. Did you hear me? The woman is not normal. <laughs> if you want to change your generation, you have to decide to be abnormal. Hello? So can we clap for Dr. Nelly for, for not being normal? <laughs> Fantastic. I've really enjoyed today so far. I, that talk you gave, Doc, was absolutely fantastic. And all the speakers, you've just been incredible. So it kind of makes, makes my job a little easy. So I, I won't say so much. Now the topic I've been given today, it's... Uh, on fatherhood. But it's fatherhood in relation to children and the marketplace. Okay? So now you know that um, the, the term father is actually a position, it's a status. And you only become a father with the presence of a third party, in this case, a child. Are you following me? And so when you hear fatherlessness, it's because that position has been evicted. It's an exit of the position that now creates the vacuum or the space. Now, initially I was thinking, I was told, by the way, that it's a professional, this, today is a professional setting. But then Dr. Tori, my dear brother, and my sister came on the stage and they were just quoting scriptures left and right. <laughs> so, now, so now I'm wondering, I was told to calm down the biblical and scriptural element, but they've given me authority. <laughs> so because they've given me authority, I will. Let me first lay a foundation, friends. This is very important. Elohim the self-existing spirit. At that time, he was in God. I'll say it again. Elohim, the self-existing spirit. At that time, he was in God. Because the definition of God is an object of worship. It means that you have to worship this thing for it to attract a new position called God. Follow me. And so, Elohim created angels and spirit beings and heavenly creatures. And then they began to worship him. And then he became God. And even though he was God, he was not a father. To be a father, you need something else to qualify your status and position as a father. And so, the Bible says, in the beginning, God made the heavens and the earth. All that did was just give him an extra status as creator. It's not still a father. 
If you look at Genesis chapter 1, and you begin to read through, and I, I, will, I, I, mean, I, I will do that tomorrow, I will speak about darkness, void, and structure tomorrow, not today. So follow me. And so he began to make things, you see? He's making things. He's not a father yet. He made animals. Then he got to the point, 26, and he said, let us make man in our image after our likeness. Animals were not made after your child is made after your likeness. And so, he made Adam and then he became a father. Did you realize that? God does not joke. Of all his characteristics, follow me, the most important one to him is actually the status of a father. There is a reason why, that's why I love what she was saying, all through Jesus Christ's existence, he called them father, father, father continually. Until the strain in that relationship. And then he called him God. Did you realize that God never forsook his children? The only time, this is important, he ever forsook his children was because of his children. Come on. Did you get that? The only time he forsook his children was actually because of you and me. People don't realize that the biggest battle in humanity at all levels is actually the struggle for fatherhood. Think about fatherhood. The biggest battle, the biggest crisis what did you think the devil was doing in the Garden of Eden? He was because he was jealous of the fatherhood status of the Almighty. Now, did you realize that? And this is important. Your fatherlessness from God is fatherhood to the devil. I'll say it again. Your fatherlessness from God is, is credence and fatherhood alignment to the devil. So every time he fights, He's looking for children he can adopt, he can steal, he can cajole, deceive with sweets. This dude is relentless. Every characteristic of Elohim, you can mention it, Savior is because of his fatherhood. The reason he gave us the Holy Spirit <laughs> is also because he doesn't joke with his status as a father. Many characteristics. If you want to appreciate the power of fatherhood, then understand the power of fatherlessness. And so those characteristics, rape, imprisonment, too much pregnancies. It's, it's astounding data. It's quite shocking. And you wonder why the world, Africa, is in the state that it is. Okay? Now, traditionally, and across all different research matters, there are three key fundamental roles of a father. So I want to go a bit deeper now. The first role is a role of a protector. Follow me? Then the second role is a role of a provider. Then there's a third role which is the role of, you might call it a trainer. But I discovered that actually the role 
transitions. This is important. So this third role is a complex role. So there's the protector, there's the provider, then there's the trainer. But the trainer role is actually it transitions from a trainer to a coach and from a coach to a mentor. Follow me. So, a protector, that's very straightforward. So the child is still young and fragile. So your job as a father is protecting the child from external features. God is still our protector because he continues to protect us from the devil. Okay? Now, the second role is that of a provider. Interestingly, for some strange reason, and culturally, especially in Africa, fathers have apportioned some high level of responsibility and credence to the provider role above all. So as long as I go to work, and bring money, and I give you money, and food is on the table, I'm a good father. Okay? Now, there's a mistake. Because the provider role, just like the protector role, is time bound. Follow me? A time comes when a child grows up, when you don't really need. In fact, the child begins to protect you. Am I making sense? Okay? A time also comes where in some sense, that child begins to provide for you. So the role of a provider is also time bound. Interestingly, the most important role that should life last a lifetime is the role of the trainer slash coach, slash mentor. It is the role that is tied to the pathway of the child once they've left your umbrella of protection and provision. It's very strange to me that the animal kingdom, you know, the animal with the largest nurturing duration in terms of taking care of the young, is probably the orangutan. And that lasts six years. The average animal is literally one, two months. If it's three months, that is a strong mother. And they're out of that space. Doesn't this surprise you that in the human kingdom, <laughs> you nurture and care for 18 years? Okay? And after the child has left that nest, their life is still confused. So animals just spend one month. And after one month of coming away from the parents, they are okay. But human beings spend 18 years in the nest of parents and they leave the home more confused than they were when they were in the home. It's a fundamental problem. And the reason is because that third role, the role of the trainer, the mentor, the coach, is the biggest, most forsaken role in the bedroom. Follow me. Solomon, all of you know, was one of the wisest men that ever lived. If God said, I will give him wisdom, this man will have so much sense. Hmm? He was blessed and bombarded with wisdom. In all his wisdom, he said, Proverbs 22, verse 6, train up a child in the way that he should go. And when he is old, so now listen, Solomon understands that the training required for the sustainability of this soul should be done at childhood. There's a reason. 
train up a child in the way he should go so that when he is old, he, he would not depart from it. Now, friends, the key underlying word here is should. He could have said, train up a child in the way he could go. The word should is a definite tense. There is no ambiguity in the word should. There is a pathway that this soul should go. Now, friends, listen. My daughter is now 14. I tell this story everywhere I go because it's an important evidence of the should factor. Many people are living in the could when they're supposed to be living in the should. And friends, listen very carefully. You will never exist and prosper in the wood. He says, listen, train up a child the way he should go so that when he's old, he would not depart from it. So the wood is tied to the shoot. Hear me? Am I speaking English? Am I speaking grammar? Okay? So the becoming of the child, the wood, what they would become, their success, their, their, their prosperity in the marketplace, in their life, in their career, is actually tied to two things. First is training, and secondly, is training them in the way they should go. So it means that to get it right, you need to first know or understand the way they should go. And then training becomes easy. Are you following me? Because once you understand the should, training becomes easy. So my daughter is uh, 14 now. And as she was growing up, um, I think she was three, then the music came on the radio. And she started moving her legs in response to the music. But it wasn't so much the movement of her legs. It was the fact that she was responding in rhythm. So that means if you increase the tempo of the song, she would increase the, the tempo of her leg movement. There was rhythm in the movement. Are you following me? By the age of four or five, now she's dancing. By the age of six, she says, Daddy, I want to write. But then she says that she began to read. She was so voracious in her reading, like she has maybe over 200 books. So we keep buying. What's your birthday gift? I want this new book. She started researching about new books and new titles, and she was reading. So when she said, I want to write a book, well, write a book. And she did. A small, nice book. Over. She never completed the book because of other things as kids would. But then she wrote this book. Now follow me. By the age of seven, she says, well, I want to draw. I say, well, let's draw. And she started drawing. What is happening? She's expressing different dimensions that could. I'll say it again. What is happening is there is a drawing. You follow me? There is the painting. What? So now, then it goes to the point she goes, well, I want to learn the piano. What is happening is this. Even though as a child or as a father, I can't clearly say her should, but at least I know her could. Are you following me? Now, your could can only come by experimentation. Many people say, well, I can't write. And I will ask them, have you tried? So you can't say you can't write if you haven't tried. Are you following me? So the exposure to could, what happens is it begins to paint a picture of the pathway that they should. So I told you, she likes dancing, right? She likes drawing. She likes reading. She likes writing. Something profound happened. 
Um, when she was going to secondary school, I think she was about eight now, eight, nine, I took her for like a tour around different schools. So normally what happens is you go from one department to the other. So she walked into a physics department and it was just okay. And she walked into the mathematics department, it was just okay. Then she walked into a kind of biology department, it was just okay. But something profound happened. Immediately she walked into the theater arts drama department. As a father, I could visibly see a change in her face. It was so profound that right then and there, I knew what was going on. There was something in her design, the shoe, that was responding to the environment she's supposed to be in. Even though as a child she may not have been able to explain it, but as a father, looking external, I was like, whoa! There is something connecting here. Fathers. Now, before I go into some practicalities, let me paint you a picture. A scientific research carried out what several researches shows. You used to think that when a mother gets pregnant, only the mother goes through physiological changes. That's not true. Science has proven that as a matter of fact, the father goes through some incredible physiological measurable changes that was never known. And can somebody guess the most significant change that the father goes through when the mother is pregnant and delivers a baby? When I tell you, you'll be surprised. It's a slight reduction in his brain. <laughs> That's actually true. The father, <laughs> well, thinking about it just makes me laugh. It's a slight reduction in the brain of the father when the child is going through that, that period of growth up to delivery. And the reason is this. As a matter of fact, the part of the brain of the father that changes is called the cortex, which is at the outer layer of the brain. Okay? So, and the cortex specific function or role is for three key things. is attention, visualization and affection. What it shows actually is this, that the mother and the father are primed by design, come on, to act in each other's role at certain times if the need requires. So a father can be a mother, and a mother can be a father. Especially within the confines of this third element of training, mentoring, or coaching. So what do I mean? Because you're a single mother, it's no justification for your child to grow up and lose their pathway. The marketplace, so practical things. So, because of the dimension of this, this training, okay, you, tra a, a trainer is somebody who imparts knowledge. I quickly classify it. You impart knowledge, understanding. Now, you graduate from a trainer to a coach when you now impart knowledge with specific achievement of goals. So that means you, you measure the goals. So that, that, that you are a coach. So the person you are coaching is gaining knowledge but growing from one level to the other. Are you following me? You now move into the role of a mentor. As a matter of fact, a mentor is the most disconnected role. Okay? Because a mentor's role is to get you to design your own goals and manage them as an overseer. Which is the reason why, through the fatherhood stages, 
at the beginning, when there's so much contact, it's a trainer. At some point, as a child begins to grow, the role switch instead of a coach. Because now you have some clarity of what this child should be doing and how to achieve it. And so you begin to set parameters towards the achievement of that goal. That's where things like, um, oh, by the way, which, what would you study in school? What would you study in university? I'll, I'll cover some particularities. Begins to come into play. As the child grows further, what happens is your role as a coach would stop at some point or reduce. And you now flip into the role of a mentor. Are you following me? From a distance, the child is figuring out what they're supposed to be doing. But then they still come back to you as a mentor does for guidance to make sure that you are managing the roles you've created for yourselves. So the fatherhood responsibility in terms of this thought element lasts a lifetime. Most of us are knowledgeable already. So you don't require training from God. The Bible is in your brain. Most of you are probably amazing at your job and what you do. And so God's role as a coach has diminished. But you will never remove his role as a mentor. That's why you keep going back to him at specific points in your life. So follow me. So, that's the basis of fatherhood. Now, why is that important? The reason is this. When a child forgets or loses that pathway of where they should be, it, it, it puts a precedent that creates problem. So now I told you my daughter draws, she paints. So what is happening is, I know what, what even though I didn't know what the, her purpose is, but I know that everything she exhibits is pointing towards the purpose. Am I making sense? This is important. People get really confused. Maybe for the sake of folks who haven't heard me say this before, I will do it again quickly, very, very quickly. No, I don't, I don't have time. If you are a designer, because sometimes you don't understand that when you call God a creator and designer, credit him for his design. I will say it again. If you call God a designer, then actually credit him as a designer. So if I was the designer of a refrigerator, are you following me? And I sent Dr. Nelly a refrigerator in her house. Then I visit her one day on her birthday, April 17th. And somewhere in the house, there are meals prepared, their friends around. And I noticed that the refrigerator I designed and gave to her is at somewhere in the corner of the house. I looked down, it's unplugged. I approached this refrigerator. Then I open it, and I discover that, you know, she has amazing dresses. I discover that she has nicely ironed her dresses, her shoes, different levels, and placed them in the refrigerator. You know, refrigerators have different compartments. So the question now is, if you were me, what would you do? I know what I would do. I will defend her. That is an insult on my design. Now, follow me. This is important. Now, notice that that refrigerator, at that point in time, is fulfilling the function of storage. So, as long as her clothes and her shoes, everything is in there, no dust will come near. But the purpose of the refrigerator is preservation of food. Your function is your code. I'm sure if I ask this room now, people will come up with new functions for a refrigerator, including carrying it to stone somebody who annoys you. Can you follow me? But the purpose is preservation. And the trouble is that you might be operating in your code. As long as you're not operating in your shield, it will come to the point in your life you're going to get a crisis. Go 
God writes it down. That's not me being a prophet of doom. It's just design. Practical things. So, the first thing is discovery. I'm wrapping up now. So, discovery comes by experimentation. So, watch that child. What keeps them busy? So, so give them different things to do. Different books. Are you feeling me? If I give my son, you know, I was telling my daughter, my son, on the contrary, is somebody science and engineering oriented. And it shows from the things he does. Are you feeling me? If I give my son a romantic novel to read, I've killed him. Hello? I have literally killed the boy. But give him a story that has to do with sci-fi, has to do with data, or computing, or going to space, or you've made his day. So what do the kids watch? Which games do they play? You know, it's so important because that is how you begin to discover what you push them into, the deep pathway. So the deep pathway is acronym for D double E D. The first D is discovery. The second E, the first E is empowerment. The second E is enhancement. And the last D is distribution. That's the pathway for self-fulfillment. So discovery. So how do you discover experimentation? Okay? They play games. Which games interest them? Which documentaries do they like watching? Are you following me? How, how, I mean, how, how do they respond? So, so this is how you begin to discover where they are lying. This is what they could be. But then the trouble is, at some point, even though they begin to shed off different elements that is not within the shield, as long as they keep doing different things. Won't I be an evil father to now compel my daughter after knowing all her interest and her passion for her to go and study medicine. Hello? That would make me a really evil father. At the age of nine, so now, discovery. So once you discover any simple, simple things, which societies do you take them to? Which games do they play? Which information do they like? When you come back home, tell them about your job. Do you do that? How many of you in this room can your daughter or your son clearly and categorically tell you what you do, why you do it, and why you don't do it? Am I making sense? Because that level of connection is for you to begin to understand that are they aligned to my job? If each time you're telling your daughter or son about what you do, and it's like a burden, you better check it before you compel them to be an accountant because you are one. Okay? So, how do they respond? Get them to read different things. If my son begins to watch documentaries about the solar system, you would have to beg him to come and eat. There's a point where when I'm traveling, I travel a lot. When I call this boy to read him bedtime story, do you know the stories he likes me to read for bedtime? It's Encyclopedia of Chemistry. That doesn't make sense. I thought that I thought bedtime stories were supposed to be like a lullaby to calm you and get you to sleep. Oh, trust me. Reading him the functions of chemistry in the solar system makes him rest. What is the rest point of the kids? What makes them happy? It's your job as a father to spot that. So that's discovery. Very quickly. Now, empowerment. Once you discover what they love, now you have to be smart and innovative to empower them in their discovery. So what do I mean? Is getting them important information. Because the Bible says, train up a child in the way they should go. So the training is an important component to get them sorted in the pathway for growth especially in the marketplace. So let me give you examples of things I started doing with my daughter. 
I wake up in the morning and I'll say, oh, sweetheart, check your phone. I just sent you a picture I took on my last trip. Can you draw it for me? And it's very interesting. And I'll, add, I'll end by saying, charge me for it. What am I doing? Empowerment is showing the child that, that gift you have is relevant and important enough to be paid for. Most of you don't know this, but I'll tell you. Last summer holidays, okay? Obviously, they were in the summer holidays, so they had like two months of, or maybe six, eight, eight weeks of being at home. I gave my 13 year old daughter a contract. All the PowerPoints for the videos on all the flexible courses, Kayla, my daughter, designed all the PowerPoints. So when you go to Flexi the mobile app which I speak about tomorrow, every PowerPoint you see on all the courses was a personal contract to her. She spent one month of her summer school chilling and just designing PowerPoint. And trust me, the girl is so good, she didn't charge me cheap. At some point, I begin to wonder, have I taught her too much about the marketplace? Because now it's almost like a thing in the house. When my wife is the daughter, uh, my, uh, my wife goes, oh, so, uh, can, you, uh, can you do this for me? I'm not even joking. It's almost like an inner thing now. Our first reaction is, is this chargeable or not? <laughs> so I have to remind her, sweetheart, I am still your father. Do this one for free. That's true. That's the place I've gotten her to. By the age of 12, she opens a company on Etsy. You can check her out, Killer Odom. And what did she start doing? She started designing like small, like uh, small cards, customized for her friends at school. Okay? It's very funny. I, I was on a trip one day. Then I get a message on my WhatsApp. So I opened the message. It was an attachment. And it was from Kayla. I remember I forwarded that, that, that uh, document to Dr. Nelly, and she was laughing her head off. So she sent the message. It was an attachment. And what's funny is there was no greeting. So this is her being very professional. There was no greeting, it was just an attachment. So I'm curious. So I opened it. Can you guess what it was? It was a business plan. It's true. So now I'm thinking, I haven't taught her how to develop a business plan. But guess what? I've taught her enough to understand the importance of research within what she loves. It's very funny. The business plan was specifically asking me for an investment into our company. And she's so nice, and she adds the emotional element to it, and she goes, it was very funny, I was reading this, she goes, remember that I am still your daughter. <laughs> okay, so I get this business plan, I read it, it was absolutely fantastic. She has to do research, she has, she has to develop like a template for businesses, and write it together. So because I understand what is going on, guess what I did? So I'm talking, guys, I'm talking about intentionality, with your children, the way they should go, because when they grow, they won't depart. I did something, like an investor will do. I replied, and I said, thank you for the business plan and for the request for investment. Can we have a meeting when I get home? And it was so funny because she, she thought I was, she was wondering, why, so, so she's not to my wife, why is that so official in his response? That my wife, who knew what, because we talked about it, she said, you ask for an investment. In the real life, you go for a meeting to present your case to the investor. So when I went to it was a Sunday morning, it's very funny, Sunday morning. She got dressed as she would. We did this in my sitting room, by the way. 
She got dressed as she would go for an interview. And I got dressed. Went to the sitting room. And she walked in and presented her business plan to me. And friends, as she's doing this, I had to hold myself from crying. Because what I was seeing wasn't what she was presenting. What I was seeing was an appreciation to the Almighty for giving me the grace to be able to act in my space as a father, pointing her in her shoe. Thank you. If you're a father in the house, if you're a parent in the house, you can give Dr. Akin a standing ovation. Come on, you can give him a standing ovation. What a powerful presentation. What a powerful presentation. Amazing. Fathers, are you in the house? Fathers, are you in the house? Or should I say parents, are you in the house? If you're a parent, just raise your hand.